And we'll say welcome to everybody to another uh, Grit Berkman Coaches Cafe. It's great to have you here for our April 2019 meeting. We're going to be talking a little bit more today about some challenges that we've been facing with Grit Berkman Coaches. The last couple of months we have uh, had some really stimulating discussions about that and felt like we still had a couple of challenges that were pending even last month that we would like to get to still. So uh, those of you that are on with us live, if you have any kinds of challenges that are coming to your mind throughout the conversation, we'd like for you to present those. Uh, and we will discuss them together, ask everybody to pitch in with any of your suggestions for people, or if you've had similar uh, situations that you have faced, that you might be able to talk to us about how you face those similar situations. And I want to uh, I want to take a privilege of presenting two with you right now. Uh, one is an experience that we had uh, last month. <clears throat> My son Brian uh, came to me with a challenge where he had a team that he is, uh, is working with. He wanted to do a Grit Berkman team build as part of their weekend uh, annual staff meeting. But they had some conflict because within their leadership, uh, the chairman of the board had an agenda that he wanted to follow, and the director had an agenda that he wanted to follow. And how did we help them get uh, reach both of their objectives? It was the director who was wanting us to actually come in and do the team build. And at first, he thought we were going to get some significant time in their weekend. But ultimately, he came back and said, you know, we've got such a full weekend that we've got to do all of our business. Uh, could you guys come to our central staff that works most closely together do what could you do for us in two hours? And my first reaction was, well, let's schedule this for another time. <laughs> uh, Brian said, no, Dad, I really think we can do something with this. Uh, let's see what we can give them in two hours. And if we get another chance with them later, that'll be great. But wouldn't two hours right now be better than nothing for a long time? And I had to say, well, okay, maybe you're right. What ideas do you have? And so he had some ideas about uh, the things that he thought would be important for us to include. And we uh, did a little bit of dialogue on that. <clears throat> and actually what we did, uh, we started out talking about uh, cultural values. We felt that it was very important to include that. And then we, we, we went almost immediately to the Berkman map on the floor. Uh, we talked about uh, personality there and had a whole lot of dialogue with the team. Spent uh, maybe about 40, almost 45 minutes on the map with the, all of the discussion that was going. The team was very much into it. Um, they had a lot of really good discussion and started getting very personal in their discussions. We were able to do the exercise of having the director stand where his usual style is and have everyone else with their need. And since we had the chairman of the board there also, we did the same thing with him to talk about how he was interacting with the group. And that went well. From there, <clears throat> then we went, moved into talking about the spiritual gifts and how that affected their behaviors. And we're able to get some pretty good conversation, even as far as talking about the dotted diamond, um, so that they could say, okay, now we see how our gifts change a lot of the things that we might have uh, been seeing in us if we were only looking at personality. And uh, then we closed out with, uh, with each of them sharing their strengths uh, and their, their biggest mistakes. We asked them to share their, you know, here's my strengths and here's my biggest mistakes. We did that together. And we had plenty of time then for affirmations at the end where the group went around and again, they participated in the affirmations very well. Uh, really beefing up, uh, zeroing in on each other's strengths and their gifts. Uh, and I was surprised at how effective I think it was. A couple of weeks later, the director came up to me and he said, you know, we're still talking about that. We're still working through that. And yes, we do want you to come back and do another one with us later on. By the way, is, it, is this in Creole? Because our staff members in Haiti sure would like to do this in, in uh, Haitian Creole. We said, wow. <laughs> what are you going to do to get it there? So, <laughs> so that, was, that was my first challenge with the shortest team build I have done yet. 
But now we're coming up to the biggest team build that we have ever done. We leave for Africa tomorrow. And Susan and I will be with six other Grit Berkman coaches with a group of uh, 155 uh, uh, personnel, overseas personnel, who are in one large meeting. We're going to, um, we're going to uh, try and do a general orientation with everyone in the first 90 minutes. And we'll have them doing the, the, um, a couple of the um, uh, insights reports. And we'll talk about cultural values. We'll get them doing some talking in pairs in that large group as part of the general orientation and just a general introduction. What is Grip Berkman and what is the Berkman? How, what is your leadership grip? How do they work? Uh, colors, symbols, triangles, all of that. And then the next, we'll have three sessions, 90 minute sessions each with them in breakout rooms where each of the six coaches um, or, or eight coaches, we will be actually, we'll have uh, two new coaches who will be with experienced, well, more experienced. We don't have very many experienced coaches in this one. Uh, it's gonna be, um, for most of them, it's gonna be their first team build ever uh, that they are leading. So Susan and I are gonna be able to kind of drop in on their rooms and supervise them a little bit where they'll be in six breakout, room, uh, breakout rooms. Um, simultaneously doing the exercises uh, and grand total will have grand total of six hours uh, with everyone and then hoping that those teams as they are going to their assignments will also be coming back and saying hey we will do want to do an additional team build after that um, so having presented those two very different challenges of a very short, very small group and medium time, if you will, six hours, uh, but with a very large group, it's sort of a large group and it's sort of uh, six team builds going on simultaneously with different people uh, in different rooms. What I would ask uh, with that challenge is, what do you all have to say about the things that you think we need to be sure that we get in? And uh, what are some of the things, if you've done any larger groups of team builds, what are some of the pitfalls or uh, things you might tell us that we ought to be watching out for? And now that you've gotten your jaws picked up off the floor. <laughs> so are these 150 people part of a, um, one large group of people? Yeah, from an organization, is that it? Yeah, and this is actually what's happening. Uh, uh, these are three what they call clusters. Only two of the clusters are actually doing the Grit Berkman. The other cluster decided they want to be doing something else. They had decided they were all going to meet together to uh, pool their resources. And um, so uh, grand total, it's going to be about 200 personnel in all that will be at that meeting. And the <laughs> team building workshops that we are doing are a part of that larger meeting, like a five day meeting. So how are you determining who's in the six um, breakout rooms? Um, is it teams that are already together then? Yeah, we have- So they'll be varying sizes? Yeah, that's a great question, Mary. Um, the, um, the training team, uh, went through the list of all the personnel to make sure that we have team intact teams meeting together in the same room. Obviously, there'll be more than one team in the room together. Uh, we've got a logistical problem that two of the rooms are theater seat style and we can't even have table. So we're going to be meeting with some real challenge with that. Um, but we're going to spend a lot of time on the floor with wall exercises and the max <coughs> having to move around a lot and, and talking in their small groups. So you will see intact teams that will have some time to be able to talk within their team. Uh, and uh, in a given room of 30 people or so that might be in the room, there might be as many as six teams or so in each of those rooms. Oh, I hear you. You're a facilitator. I'm sorry, Shannon, what was that? Yeah, will, will each team have their own facilitator when they're broken up small? 
no, we don't have enough coaches to actually do that. Um, so the coach is going to have to be moving around from team to team, giving them some instructions. We will have some written instructions for them uh, mm -hmm. so that uh, the team leader can help to guide their discussions. But we're going to try and do a whole lot of activity-based things where it's okay. The facilitator says, now in your team, do this. And um, then the facilitator can move around from team to team, table to table as they're working together. Okay. It sounded to me like you were saying, Larry, that there's two different groups within the larger group that actually haven't done the recruitment. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah. For a lot of these people, this is their, uh, of the 157, I think is the number that I had of the number of people that are going to be there. Uh, we had 126, I think was the final number of people who, who this is the first time they have been exposed to the grit at all. So, so they, haven't had, they haven't had an individual conversation with their own results or anything? Up to this point, a number of them will not have had their individual conversations yet. They're gonna be there getting their first exposure here. Some have. Yeah. yeah. So how are you preparing the, um, the other coaches that you're bringing with you um, to kind of be on the same page with you to lead those other groups so that there's unity even though they're in breakout groups. Yeah, um, we uh, have a very detailed script that we have written for the exercises and um, we're gonna be having daily meetings with them. Fortunately, we all get in um, a full day before uh, the workshops begin. So we're gonna be able to talk through those exercises and be sure uh, for some of them, uh, they will be script followers, I know. Some of them will follow a very detailed script, and we tried to even, you know, say, say this now, and uh, as we were dictating it, putting down the very words that we would try to be saying to the team. And we're all going to try and follow that same script pretty closely. It sounds really exciting, Larry. I'm so... I'm, I wish I could be a fly on the wall to watch this whole thing. Like what a learning environment that's going to be. Yeah, I uh, would sort of like to have a, a video of it uh, so that we could even uh, make more mistakes. <clears throat> so how do, you, how do you see the group processing the team elements of this when the individuals have processed their own individual? Yeah, you know, the good... The good and the bad news, Les, we used to do our, um, our trainings, our team builds, uh, with everyone there in the workshop first, and then we would do one-on-ones with them afterwards. Okay. So we've had some experience doing it that way before. Um, we followed a model that had been given to us actually by... Um, uh, foundations of Leadership from the uh, Creative Center for Leadership in Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, where they were, they, their model was a lot of teaching time in the workshop, a lot of activities together, and then you do a one-on-one -on -one, uh, with a coach to develop your action plan. And so we followed that model for a couple of years, in fact, uh, using the Grit Berkman as part of what we were doing with them. And... Um, what that meant was in the workshop, we had a whole lot more teaching time, learning to read your report, now talk about it with a partner and a lot of one-on-one uh, -on -one with someone else and we would be wandering around listening to them and then answering their questions. Or at every meal and every, before breakfast and after dinner every night, we would have one-on-ones with people throughout the, the three-day workshop. So um, our expectation will be for every one of them to have a one-on-one -on -one following the workshop if they have not already had one prior to it. Probably grand total of about 50% of the people will have had a one-on-one -on -one before they get to the workshop. Because 35 of them were in a team build in September when we were working with their leadership, their extended leadership team, and they already have had their grip workman and have had their one-on-one. What's motivating them wanting to have the, um, the team build done? Um, 
I'm not sure I can answer that. Mary, um, I don't know if I would say what's motivating. We're seeing within that organization more and more people are um, seeing value in Grit Berkman. Uh, Shannon, and I can pick on you because you're part of the larger organization that, that we're working with there. And maybe you could answer some of that. Yeah. Well, so, uh, just to go back in history, my first exposure to Grit Berkman was in a large group exposure. There were about 45 of us in a room. Uh, maybe a third had pretty good familiarity with Rip Berkman. And the rest, it was their first exposure. And uh, what we saw happen was because there's so much information about yourself and then trying to tie it up, tie it together with others, many people just kind of got overloaded and basically quit quit participating. They, they just kind of went, went through the motions, kind of looking at their watch, wondering when are we going to finally be done. Uh, so one thing I would suggest is that as you're doing those self-facilitated times where there's not a, a coach facilitating, is maybe pass the facilitation baton around. And so in those subgroups, different people facilitate different sections, and you got more chance of keeping, keeping them engaged knowing that, hey, you're going to get the baton for the next session, so pay attention, stay stay engaged. Otherwise, it's just really easy to go. I'm not in charge. I don't get this. I didn't get an individual coaching. I'm checking out. Mm. But if, uh, but if they know they may get the baton, then it's a it's a little different level of uh, commitment to stay engaged. Yeah, that's a good point. And you know, one of the things that we are doing, Shannon, is is trying to um, intersperse. A lot of the activity where, you know, you're up on the floor, when you're on the floor, we have seen this checking out, even when you're on the Berkman map, that if we're staying on the map too long, mm -hmm. or we're trying to let everybody go around and read their, uh, their statements on their profile or whatever, that some of those people, particularly um, on the top side of the, of the map, will start to begin to check out. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're hoping to say we, we, we're doing enough activities and changes in activities uh, and a lot of now turn to your uh, partner and turn to the person next to you and in pairs discuss this together. Right. We're hoping we're going to have enough of that that will help to keep the people engaged that way. Um, the other thing about motivation, Mary, um, is as people have good experiences with this, other people hear about it and it's like, hey, I heard that this team over here had a really good experience. We want to have that too. Uh, and hearing about this Rip Berkman thing, uh, how do we get on? And it's, um, it has not been a top down thing, uh, at least not from the very top of the organization. Now in this particular case, we have a, uh, uh, what's called a, a, an affinity leader who would be like a regional director court sort of person. He has led his team to say, we want to do this, but he's letting each of the cluster leaders decide when they want to do it and how they want to roll it out to their clusters. After, uh, before we had even finished the team build with that um, leadership team, this, these two cluster leaders came up to me and said, hey, we're going to have a big meeting next summer. Um, we would love for you to to, to come help us do this. Do you think we could do this with that large group then? And we started thinking about it. Uh, how might we do this? So it's not being dictated to them. It is coming um, pretty much from the grassroots uh, level of leadership saying that they want, they're wanting their people to get it. Cool. Les, did I see you were, you were about to say something? I, th I thought I saw a thought forming there. <laughs> it's probably still forming. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so if you when you group that large with a number of subgroups um what do you anticipate in terms of um what i would call say the surprising dynamics where you discover maybe one of the teams hits a bump or you know some of that kind of stuff and how are you What's your strategy working with your coaches to try and make sure they're ready for that and don't miss that in the midst of what's going on in the conversations? 
Yeah. Um, you mean like if you get a difficult person who says, I just don't get it or. Well, it or like I think like, when you put, you know, 150 people in the room from, from several different teams, those teams are all going to be at different levels of cohesion. Yeah. And they're going to be bringing in different types of baggage. And I don't use baggage in a negative way. It's just you're bringing stuff with you. Some of it will be very positive. Some of it may be negative. And if it begins to bubble up in the midst of this, you've got, a, have you got a, uh, uh, some prep done to try figure out how you're going to address that if some sticky points start to develop for some of the groups that you couldn't possibly have known were going to show up until all of a sudden they're right in front of you. Yeah. And I guess the, the good news is we're actually a team of eight coaches who will be there on campus at the same time. And so, um, and Four of the, well, five, five of the eight are member care. Okay, that's good. Um, and two of the eight are part of their large training team. And there's, and then there's me. <laughs> so, I'll be the fish more foul. <clears throat> So um, hopefully we will have enough resources between all of us that we can, in our daily debriefing meetings, we'll be able to uh, talk about some of those. If, if, if the coach even might, might see that, hey, I've got this one team that doesn't seem to be getting it, and I'm not clicking with them or whatever, we might be able to make some adjustments that way. That's all I can think about. But if you've got other ideas about that, man, by all means, let me know now. So are you and Susan going to be floats or will you have your own breakout like could you float around and be a troubleshooter for the other groups we had originally thought that was going to be the case but because we have two coaches that have never led a team build we're wanting them to actually be with another coach so um if if we're prepared to make that adjustment and go back to that idea of where we would be floaters if we need to. But right now, each of us is going to be with a, a, a team in the room. They've assigned us, and I'm not exactly sure what criteria they use to say, well, actually, I do. Susan's going to be with all of the folks that are in support roles that are not in front, what they call front line work. Uh, so she's going to have a large group of people in support roles. And I'm not sure in my own case about the particular room that they assigned me to. We, we trusted their training team to make those assignments. So I wish we could be just floaters, but no, we're not going to be able to just do that, at least not in the beginning. Larry, one idea might be is uh, if somebody poses a question uh, with one of those little subgroups and your, your new coaches really feel stumped, uh, if, if there's an agreement in the group to say, hey, we're just going to call that a good question, and we're going we're gonna to say, man, good question. We're going to write it down. And then when you come back together as a large group, you can go through group by group and say, hey, did we have any really good questions that came out of this? And then it could get forwarded up. And then you and whoever else could handle the, you know, whatever you want to call it. The, I'm going to get a positive term, good question. Because uh, then it's, then it's uh, instead of someone guessing or someone going, oh, man, I don't know. Or it, it allows for a way to, to get the question answered. Or it may be funny to, if they actually stump you and you go, wow, I've never heard that one before. That's great. And it sparks something. But that way somebody doesn't have to, the new coach doesn't have to be the, the high level expert on everything that could possibly be asked. But it's, a, it's an easy way to chart it and come back and attack it. I've heard them called parking lots in the past. Yeah. yeah. yeah parking lots, if you want to draw them down or have whatever way you want to term it. But it just lets people know, hey, you, you, the new coach, has an escape outlet, and we want to get that answer before we all walk out of here. That's a great, that's a great uh, heads up to Shannon, a great idea. Uh, in fact, you know, we, we try to tell coaches that in coach training all the time. You don't have to be the absolute final expert on all things related to your leadership grip or the Berkman. And um, 
there are times when I have to say to somebody, you know what, I'm going to need some more time to go do a little investigation on this one. Yeah. Um, uh, the first time I had a, uh, I, I had a, an individual who was looking at their interests and um, when they looked at the asterisk on their Berkman map, it was in one quadrant. But when they looked at their list of individual interests with the 10 interests, uh, none of the top interests on their list was of the same color as their asterisk was, that their asterisk was on the map. And I said, wow, that's the first time I've seen that. I'm not sure what happened there. I'm going to have to go find out what that is. Mm -hmm. And it took me a while to get the answer for it. Mm -hmm. But I did, I did try to make sure I answered her back. Uh, wasn't able to get the answer for her right there during the workshop. It had to be a couple of weeks later. Um, and by the way, the answer to that was she did, she had no really high interests. She had a lot of mid scores and a lot of what was pushing her asterisk into that quadrant were her aversions that were repelled mm -hmm. into that. Interesting. Yeah, it was, it was really interesting, but yeah, Shannon, that's a great word that we need to keep reminding the coaches. Uh, it's fine to get stumped. Just make sure that you let the person know you're going to try and find the answer for them. Cool. Yeah. Bob, we've been letting you sit silent through all this, but if you've got any comments or anything you'd like to add to it, uh, we definitely would welcome that. I primarily deal with individuals in very small groups, so you're out of my league. <laughs> Well, hey, come back. Let me get you to come back to that other one uh, where we were doing that two hours to build and talk to us about some things like that. If we did a small group, what are some things that you like to do with those smaller groups? Well, I usually start them with a, some type of a game to hmm. get them generated up and whether it's, you know, something real simple that's quick and maybe bouncing ping pong balls into a little bowl or something like that and with a timed element, but to get, and I divide them up by different usual behaviors so that that group then can get a little feel of what that usual behavior, how each will respond in their usual behavior. And then from that, we break it down into using the map uh, where then we have them share. It seems like that has kept them a little more interested in each other. And, uh, yeah. That thing of using some kind of an icebreaker and activity in the very beginning to just get them interacting in any way with each other, uh, but in a non-threatening kind of a way and not having to reveal too much about themselves or you know, you're not getting down into their nitty gritty of their intimate reports. That sounds like a, like a great idea. Tell me about this thing you said, bouncing ping pongs into the bowl. What, what is that? We do that with our grandchildren, so and they love the game, so I figured adults would like it, too. Basically, you set up a bowl a certain distance away, and then they have X number of ping pong balls, and then they bounce, and we do the one-minute deal, and they have one minute to see how many balls can land in the bowl, and you have four or five teams going, mean, you know, you have it two cup, two or three together, depending on the size. And so each of them have one minute. So the one who wins, they all cheer, you know, or give them a prize. But it, I, I, then I asked a question, well, what did you observe how each person approached the bouncing of the ball? <laughs> and that gives them an idea of, okay, this is how this, this is the usual behavior of this person. And then it kind of, so from there I go into their usual behavior let each person share. All right. That sounds like fun. Sounds great. Got to do some way because they're all like, oh, okay, what are we doing here? So, you know, <clears throat> break it up and get them laughing and going right, right off the bat. Then I do throughout the whole day, I'll do, uh, we have different games that we do just again to give the break, but also to let them see different things. Excellent. One of the things I like doing now with the team builds, I've done two or three times. I love the Berkman buzz cards, mm. the interest buzz cards. And really early in, in the team thing, we break them up into groups of two or three and just get them working through the buzz cards, answering the questions, talking about how their interests affect 
to the way they answered the question. And it really is a very eye-opening thing for them to see how they come at the question from different perspectives based on their interests. And it ends up being a icebreaker too, because it gets them thinking about something where there's there's a lot that they're putting out there, but they're starting to share individual from their perspective and that i use those all the time now they've been fantastic yeah those conversation cards buzz cards are are neat for people that um that that have access to them because they've been through signature level training um and you know just just the whole thing now when you're doing that less you're talking about interest first right so you're getting them started that's not yeah, a bad question. So we, we you know, our team builds it. We're, I'm not sure it would matter what the size was. You know, we start, get, we do a little review, and then we get them building their map and their <laughs> poster card. And then we go right into the interest buzz cards and just get them sitting about that kind of stuff. And at, they, at the end of that, they feel so primed up because they've already, they've already started to lay out some stuff. They've looked at each other's maps. Then they've started to see the way they look things differently as a result of their interest shape the way they even think about a question and then they dialogue around that a little bit and by that you've really got them warmed up and going i hear you yeah. excellent well folks i have dominated the first half of our time but i'd like to be sure and get to any other challenges that some of the rest of you might have that you've faced recently or even in the past if you want to bring up some uh, challenge that you faced and like to share that with us does anyone have something you'd like to share well i'll drop in one more idea uh, when dealing with limited time and knowing that uh, like you had your two hours mm -hmm. um, I've had a situation where I was just doing a, an overview with people, but I had a large group, it was about 30 in the room, but it was a refresher. Everybody had already gone through a team build before, uh, but uh, they were all in the room. And, and so what I did was say, we, we just wanna remind ourselves, refresh ourselves about our areas of interest. And so I asked them, uh, everyone divide up and get into groups based on your number one or your top interest. And so everyone just scattered and had, you know, had it labeled where to go. So they all just scattered there. And then I just gave them the question, uh, as a group, how, how does this activity uh, empower you, enthuse you, or feed you? And so they, they all got to look to face each other and kind of talk about it. And then I, then I broke them up and said, okay, everybody now go to your, your least interest, your bottom, your bottom interest. And then, uh, so everybody spread back out and then I had them do the question, how, how does when you have to do this activity, do you feel overwhelmed or drained or it just basically you loathe it? And so they all, you know, got together and shared that. And then I said, now pick your, pick your, your middle one and broke them up, put them in their middle interest. And everybody looked around the room and realized the answers were the same, which was, you know, how often or how much could you do this activity? And it's like, well, yeah, I can do it. I mean, I don't, I don't get a buzz out of it. It doesn't kill me, but, and uh, so it was just a really good reminder of this is why areas of interest are important to remember and even think about for yourself and for others. And so when you're planning something, those people that really got a buzz out of that thing, well, think of groups that things that you could do with them. Those tasks that people may loathe, well, just remember you're not going to get your best performance giving those people that particular task. And it was, it was a, a, like a 15 minute exercise, maybe 20 minutes, but it reinforced what they already knew, but now they knew more about that as a larger group. And they found people just like them that they go, hey, you're like me, cool. So that was a, that was a 20 minute exercise to refresh, but got the, got the, you know, drove home the ideas without spending a ton of time. Hey, that's fantastic, Shannon, and a great way to keep the conversation going with, you know, the common language that we're trying to give them as they're continue to build teams. And I, I think sometimes leaders don't realize how important interests are uh, in making assignments to people uh, and how many times so many people have to fall back to a hobby or I get replenished, you know, away from work because the things that they are doing in the work 
is not uh, are not um, directly related to the interests that they really have. So that, that's a great way to keep that fresh, Shannon. The so, idea was just something quick instead of, you know, elongating it. Just let's let's hit it and let's move on. And they're like, ah, oh, that was helpful. So. And when speed is of the essence, it's you almost have to just kind of go for the top, the very bottom, the middle, and let's cut through it. Yeah. Anyone else have another challenge you'd like to share? One of the things that I basically, basically from research I'm doing and working with a, a psychologist on is helping people really understand and identify their key needs. Mm. And because I think that's where your friction builds if those needs aren't met. And so I've been trying to come up with some exercises to show them how, how important their needs are in, in, their, in, in all the four areas. But if you'll see your needs, you'll reduce stress. And uh, we, I use the word, what, is, what emotion are you feeling and if you can identify the emotion, you can control your feeling. Mm. So have anyone had experience in this area particularly? I, that's just, I'm just seeing that, especially because I primarily work with pastors. Les, I'm thinking what you guys are doing there because you're working within one congregation with people, but that whole thing of, of needs and expectations, how, how are you addressing that? You're, like I've always heard since I got involved with the Grookman, this, the notion of coaching to the need, you know, and we really, I think we utilize that reasonably well but we try to do it i think if i hear you right Bob, there's that idea of trying to help them be able to identify and then manage on the basis of needs and stress and we spend a fair bit of time with our people trying to help them i always use the phrase that your stress is the canary in the coal mine you know right. and when you see a particular stress be to manifest itself in you that's a sign that there's something in your atmosphere that isn't working anymore and the canary's starting to flop over. So then it's a time to drive back to the needs and figure out what's going on there. And I think for us, it's been helpful to get people to the point where they begin to take ownership of being able to sort some of that out for themselves as opposed to kind of, um, having somebody need to react to them on the basis of what's happening. And, you know, the other thing we talk with our teams all the time is the standard kind of uh, cultural thing is to try and manage your stress. And, you know, if you, if this stress is coming up, you're supposed to try and manage that. And the reality is using kind of the canary in the coal mine analogy, we don't see the stress as something that's simply to be managed, we see it as a, a warning flag for us to go back and actually start to reassess the stuff and to work there primarily. And I think that's a bit counterintuitive for people mm. because they try and work on the stress behavior that's manifesting itself, but you can do that all day. If you don't change the need, the stress behavior is not going away. So that's been helpful for us to try and really get it to the point where people understand this is something that this is a gift to you. When you, when you begin to understand what your stress behaviors are, it's a gift to you because it, it helps you understand what, something in that environment that isn't working right. And then you can go back and try and figure out what that is and work at it from the need base. Yeah, good. I like that. And I throw in a problem solving and instead of thinking of how you use your behavior problems, solve this problem, what are the needs you have to solve yeah. this problem? Yeah. I do have a question about um, taking care. Um, is it, so if, you're, if your need is in a particular quadrant, um, is it beneficial to identify people whose usual style 
is actually in that particular quadrant in order to help um, um, have your need met? Is that a benefit? Um, like for instance, if somebody is a is their usual style is in red, but their um, their need sits in the blue. Is it helpful for them to have um, people in their life that actually their usual style is blue? Um, need is um, is actually understood by that person and can be helpful to walk them through it. Or is it better to have them connect with somebody who actually is still in the red because that's how you kind of take care of your need and move you out of, out of your stress behavior. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, let me, let me um, make a comment to that, Mary, because your stress behavior is, uh, is negative. By nature, it is negative. It appears to others negative. Um, and in, in the case of most people, most of the time, and I have to use the word most there, because we see that when we dig down into it, especially when we get to the signature reports, that sometimes this is not true. But most of the time, their stress behavior does give us an indication of what their need is, most of the time. Um, so I think what you're suggesting, yes, could be helpful. Uh, let's say I'm having very blue stress behavior, as an example, and I'm uh, withdrawing from the group and you know, becoming more isolated, becoming more introverted, becoming quieter in my communication with people uh, because my need is for some kind of either, um, you know, the selectively sociable always comes up with those blue people. So, mm -hmm. so my need might be for interaction with just one or two people, or I really need some alone time. Uh, and so if another person comes along with a corresponding behavior that is in their usual style, so it's going to be positive uh, in that general area, uh, the difference between my behavior and theirs is, is whether mine is negative and theirs is positive in that same quadrant. Well, that figures I've just lost you. <laughs> Hello. Are we back again? Yep, you are. Okay. <laughs> um, so it, it, I, I think the answer to your question is yes, they can take some cues from those people, but ultimately it's, it's um, them having to seek out what is it that they need and how are they going to get that need met. Um, some, for some reason, they're in that stress behavior because their expectation is not being met by other people around them. And so what do they need to do to get that met? Well, you could say, okay, go find that person who's in that blue behavior. That might help. But for, for me, what they really need is to be able to express to people close around them, help me because this is what I need from you. Because yeah. Getting that need met from that person that's already in that blue behavior might be one thing, but their stress might be being, caused, be being caused by somebody that's got very red behavior in their usual style. And what do I do to communicate to that person, I have this need, how might you be able to help me with this particular need? Uh, let's say in a supervisor, for example, because we have a lot of supervisors that have very red, yellow behavior. And in a lot of the organizations we work with, they have a lot of blue, green be uh, people that, that they're working with. So how do we help that person with that red or yellow kind of usual behavior learn how to help meet the needs of the people over there on the other side. Bob, I think you're on to something there um, of you know, zeroing in on that. One of the biggest things about the Berkman uh, that no other personality assessment that I have ever worked with shows is not just how we behave, but why we behave one way sometimes under certain circumstances, and we might behave a different way under other circumstances. What are those underlying motivations for our behavior? Now, this psychologist I'm working with is working heavily on the ERIQ. Mm -hmm. and, you know, let's face it, in any organization, that emotional relational intelligence is critical. And that's why he gave me some good feedback on it. And, we're still working through it, but uh, he's 
got a few thousand, hundred years of experience in this field. So I'm leaning on him pretty air, pretty heavily right now. Yeah, I hear you. Well, and the Berkman is, is great for helping to develop. Yeah. And he's Berkman trained as well. So good. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Sounds like fun to me. Yeah. It's interesting. At least I'm learning. <laughs> well, let's not stop doing that. My father-in-law always used to say, um, the day you stop learning is the day you died. So you want to learn something new every day. Yeah, totally. Yeah, let's, let's stay in that learning mode by all means. Well, folks, we are coming close to the top of another hour where we've had um, a good discussion. Uh, anybody has another last minute question or comment or situation you'd like to present to us? We certainly want to give you time to do that. But it looks like with a small group, we all got to present pretty much what we wanted to today then. Next month, we're going to have a little bit of a different format, I hope. I hope, I can't tell you for sure it's not confirmed, but I'm hoping we're going to have a presenter who's going to share with us uh, some, some challenging information. Uh, be watching for that. By the way, uh, since we are a small group here, and I don't know how many people have been listening in on the recording, but I'll give you a sneak preview that we are in the, um, uh, what we call the beta and break stage of uh, looking at our new website that's getting ready to go live. Um, uh, just a little teaser to say we hope it's going to be live very soon. Uh, there are a lot of bugs that need to be worked out of it still as we're looking through all the different uh, aspects of it, but I think you're going to really enjoy some of the developments that are going to be coming. Uh, when it goes live, it won't be absolutely 100% of everything that we're wanting it to do. Uh, there'll still be some things we want to add, but we're gonna want to go live with it first to get started and then make those adjustments as more and more of us will have input into it. So i uh, give you that teaser. Uh, and let me also give you a teaser that um, our annual meeting this year is going to really be different. Uh, be watching in the newsletter for some information about team of teams as we're going to be calling people to come together, not for a sit and soak kind of meeting at all. We're gonna be asking you to come with an attitude of what's your contribution going to be. It's going to be a work session where we will be dividing up into teams of people. What area do you want to help in? Do you wanna help in the area of equipping or in the area of supporting or in the area of connecting? And uh, as we are dividing ourselves up into those three areas, uh, we'll have some assignments that we'll be working on, and we'll also be making ourselves assignments that we'll work on after we leave that place. It's going to be in a beautiful campground up not very far from you, Les. We're going to Rob Taves' camp <coughs> nice. up north of Ed Edmonton. Yep. Uh, and that's going to be at the end of September, and I think going to be a really fun time. And by the way, Mary, you know that Rob does have horses. Yes, I do. <laughs> I keep asking about that, that they are going to be available. So uh, that gives you something, that, that gives you a, um, maybe a goal to be working toward. <laughs> so i uh, love to see everybody uh, that, that comes to that meeting uh, coming with an attitude of, I'm not just coming to, to receive, I'm coming to give. And of course, in that process, I'm sure we will all receive quite a bit as well. Really looking forward to this. I think it's going to be a fantastic time for us to be together building community, uh, which is one of our uh, very large values uh, that Grip Berkman is not just a company, it's not just an assessment, it is a community of coaches with like beliefs working toward the same goals in our different places of work in the ministry. So with those two teasers, let me say thank you folks for joining us this month. It has been great to be with you. And Mary, I'm going to ask, would you lead us in a word of prayer to close us out? Sure. Lord Jesus, thank you for this time that we get to spend together every month. I, um, I'm just so encouraged each time I enter into it and miss it when I can't. Lord, I just pray that you would bless Larry and Susan as, and the team as they head over to Africa to do this team build. Um, I pray that you would uh, make your presence felt very intimately, that you would guide the process, um, 
that people's hearts would be softened and open to uh, hearing not just how you have wired them, but how you've wired them for team and how they can support and benefit their own teams. And that each person has an important contribution to make. Uh, thank you for the way that you seek us out. Thank you for the way that you build us up and um, equip us for um, not just partnership with you, but for life with you, Lord. And um, so I just thank you for this time and pray a special blessing on each person that's here and that you would uh, just bless the work of our hands from now until the time that we meet again. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Lord, bless you. Lord, you continue to help build unity in the body of Christ so more people will know Jesus. Yeah. Amen. Have a great time. I'm envious. <laughs> Thank awesome. You. See ya.